Good evening, um, and welcome. Thank you very, very much for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure. Um, it is at the moment, anyway. <laughs> the conversation just started. We'll see in 45 minutes. Um, so I wanted to start by taking the title of this talk seriously, um, Rethinking Democracy. Um, and to ask you to give a little bit of a kind of health check on global democracy, um, to stand as a physician by the bedside and look over at the patient, and to give a little bit of a prognosis about its uh, prospects. Okay, that's, uh, that's actually, I think, uh, the questions you might ask, the, the simpler one. Uh, um, it's not very healthy, and, uh, and it has uh, been getting visibly less healthy since the middle of the first decade of this century, in the sense that uh, that was the stage at which people looking closely at what was going on in countries around the world and uh, uh, looking at opinion polls uh, began to th talk about a democratic recession, which was a, a phrase, as far as I know, invented by Larry Diamond, who teaches at Stanford and has, is one of the world's leading scholars on the state of democracy. He coined in an article which was published, I think, in 2006, so that's 17 years ago. And if you look at any of the standard indices uh, from Freedom House, for example, US think tank, which sort of grades democracies, um, uh, uh, you look at the number of countries that are, have autocratic heads uh, um, on any, almost any um, obvious uh, measure, and some of them include some pretty important countries over the last, over this period, India would be one on that uh, count, Turkey would be another. Um, the, uh, in uh, Orban's Hungary certainly would be, though there's been a bit of a, I'll come to that in a moment, a bit of a reversal in Poland. And of course, uh, we've had the Trump experience. And so the, the, the uh, uh, on pretty well every measure, um, the, uh, uh, the uh, democracy has been in decline. This should be put in a broader context, I think, because it followed uh, and I have a rather neat chart in my book on this, which you should, of course, look at. Um, it followed a period of extraordinarily widespread democratic transition. Um, you yourself, I think, came from South Africa, so you were part of one of the more important ones. And, uh, uh, but really, from um, the late 70s and, of course, accelerating enormously uh, after um, the fall of the Soviet Union. And then, of course, also in many de developing countries uh, which had had dictatorships, in Africa, for example, there was a, an enormous move towards democracy in terms of number of countries, uh, which reached a peak at about 2006 7 And we're still, by historical standards, pretty high, roughly about half of the regimes of the world by number will be counted as being plausibly democratic in the sense that they do have competitive elections. So that's still not too terrible, but the general shift has been away from it. Um, there, there's clearly lots of evidence uh, of that. And it's also important to remember uh, that it ha this has affected some very important democracies. I've just mentioned India and the US, the two biggest. And of course, we are living in an age in which uh, China is a superpower. It wasn't 50, 20 years ago. And I think however, whatever you describe the Chinese regime as, it's not democratic. And Russia, which maybe 20, 25 years ago, one might still have had a hope for, uh, certainly in the early 90s, we were still talking about it. But well, it's pretty clear what's happened there. So I think we have to say that it's, it's a democratic recession. 
So I participated in a rather horrifying debate and COP in Glasgow hosted by the New York Times about, which asked the following question, um, are democracies or autocracies better at getting us to net zero? Uh, and two sets of people debated between themselves. There was a vote in a New York Times audience, so you can imagine what their general predisposition was. And at the end of the debate, um, the sort of 60, 40 consensus in the room was that autocratic rule was much better at getting to net zero. So I'm going to ask you, as a committed Democrat and somebody who lived through the South African transition, um, is this moment not one in which we may have to be involved in sort of awful trade-offs? Well, um, that's very interesting to me. Um, I, I'm just thinking of it. Is there the slightest bit of evidence for this proposition? I like evidence, you see. Uh, um, I discovered today that uh, empiricism is considered a, an, Out of imper fashion. an imperialist plot. <laughs> but, the, but I'm actually rather in favor of empiricism. Yeah. And I'm not aware of any uh, information. Now, I'll make three comments on this. One, I'm old enough, it's advantageous, uh, to have been a fully adult human being in the 60s. And uh, in that the time, that time, it was quite widely believed that whatever you could say about these communist tyrannies, which were all over the world, at least they got things done. Uh, and what, they were clearly more effective at developing their countries and all the rest of it, notably including the Soviet Union. Um, uh, and that turned out not to be entirely accurate. So when people say this, I think they have this romantic idea that because a tyrant can get things done, he, and by the way, it always is he, um, will. Yeah. That doesn't follow. The second point I would make is we have a lot of evidence of how autocracy behaves, and it's more or less as you'd expect. It's a very, very high variance system because, surprise, surprise, there are no checks and balances. So if you end up with a despot who is mendacious, predatory, unbelievably ruthless, and utterly indifferent to the welfare of his people, which is quite common, believe it or not, you don't make much progress. So when people say they are in favor of autocracy now, I imagine what they would have to point to is basically China, and uh, which has certainly had a pretty effective regime, possibly Vietnam, though I don't know how many people really know much about Vietnam. And there really aren't any others, unless you're going to go to Singapore. My friends in Singapore will start uh, getting anxious about this, though I wouldn't mind the description. But the basic point is, Sing China has been a freak. Uh, it should be said that up to now, though they are talking a good game, they have been the most spectacularly high and rapidly increasing emitter in the history of the world, and that's because they were completely focused on something else. And that's another side of dictatorship autocracy, that they don't really care about things unless they really decide they care about things. So I think that's... Uh, 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 um, so that all of this, I think, is basically nonsense. In any case, if... Finally, I could go on for this forever. It's a big part of my book. Uh, if finally, and I'm not going to talk about why she is ruining China, but the uh, if finally uh, we um, uh, do um, uh, sort of want to um, fix the climate problem of the world, which must be fixed basically decisively in the next 10 years, and before that, we have to overthrow every democratic regime and replace it by a functioning dictatorship, which is settled in. I would regard that as about the most roundabout, i.e. totally ludicrous way of fixing this problem. So I suggest to anybody who thinks that way, just forget it and go directly to the problem. I think that's about the best rebuttal of that argument I've heard, and I've heard many, so uh, hallelujah for that. So now I'm going to come to, the, to take your question seriously about democracies uh, and the quest to net zero. And, and, and now let's come to some inconvenient facts. Um, I think that what we've encountered to date is this 
at least a kind of stripes of progressive thinking with which I associate myself, that we can get to net zero in a just transition way and do so in a way that offsets pre-existing inequality and builds economies from the bottom up. And if we do so, we can build durable coalitions of voters who will support net zero, but also feel as though they're getting a fair deal from that. And if that's not true, then look at the elections that are going to occur next year, both in the United States and the United Kingdom, and see that the battle lines around this question are already drawn. So, and the trick with that is, is that I think the green transition is not generating as many jobs, at least in electorally salient timeframes, as we hoped it might. And I think that's a conundrum for progressive Democrats who want to conjoin economic equity with the net zero transition. And I'd love you to unravel that for us. Well, I'm not, you see, I work for the Financial Times, so obviously I'm not a progressive Democrat in your terms. If I were, I don't know what I would work for, not I think the Guardian anymore, but anyway, I wouldn't be working for the Financial Times. So I have, uh, I will phrase this in a different way. You want to achieve a just, energy efficient, uh, climate safe, uh, democratic world and my answer to that is you'll hate this I mean whoever created the universe didn't make plans for us to get everything at once and particularly not in a timetable of about the timetable of 10 or 15 years so I think you're going to have to make some choices chum and they're going to be quite difficult ones so I would see it uh, in this way. Let's assume for the moment that our priority, let's assume, is to put us on this green path pretty soon. And it is, and then you have to ask what you need to get there. Okay, so this is goal, means. So the, all these other objectives for the moment fall under the means category. Um, my view has been there are two necessary conditions. They're very, very difficult. The first is a technological means that allows us to do this without actually uh, uh, reducing the standards of living of the world and the hopes of higher standards of living of the poorer parts of the world by dramatic amounts because my view is there isn't the slightest chance of that happening. So I'm going to put this to one side, but I think the sort of degrowth idea is fun, but it has nothing to do with what's going to happen in the world. So the first thing is the possibility of operating an economy which isn't wildly different from ours in its productive system with a completely new energy system, which is itself a staggeringly ambitious project. And what I would say is, having followed this reasonably closely from outside for 20 years, um, compared with where we, are, where we were when my friend Nick Stern wrote his climate report, which was so seminal, uh, it's clearly the most important thing the, the Blair Brown governments did, um, is that the general view of people engaged in this is that technology, like the productive system of energy, has improved from our point of view far faster than anyone really believed would happen. So this has been a big boon, and we owe a lot of that, and I think I've written that one, to the Chinese. Uh, and the, and the, the result of that is, just been writing a column about this, which will appear in our COP28 um, special issue, um, that from a technological point of view, it all looks much more plausible. Unfortunately, the time left to make it happen has been reduced spectacularly, so we have to go much faster than what might have been the case if we'd had all these means 20 years ago. And that gets to the second thing, which is the politics of all this. And essentially we have to do, and this is where my column ends, so I would say, there are essentially two gigantic political tasks, 
and I'm much better at defining the task than giving the, op the, uh, the solution because that's why I didn't go into politics. And, uh, but I can say that not many people have come with it. The, the, you have to create a politics which convinces a pretty sizable proportion of the population, and more than half, enough that people will stick with it when it gets difficult, because it will, um, that it's n not going to deprive them of features of their lives and hopes for the future that matter to them. And this, as a matter of fact, is far more important in emerging and developing countries than in developed countries. Because, as I'm sure you know, already about two-thirds of the emissions in the world are generated by the emerging and developing countries, and all the growth is going to come from there. So that's where the politics really bite and where the politics have hardly started. This is... I mean, I won't go into all the detail. That itself, this, if you like, the complex domestic politics of this, which are obviously going to be redistributional uh, in important ways, are going to be very, very, very difficult. And a lot of the um, resources to make this possible are going to have to come inevitably from the better off in our societies, who are not going to go happily. And the, the second and even more difficult part of this, I think, than that, is where the politics is, is central, which is the global politics, which because nobody's going to do anything really, really dramatic if everybody else isn't. I mean, that's pretty obvious. There are too many free riders in the system. Now, the number, I mean, there are lots and lots of countries who won't make much difference, so you don't have to get everybody on board. But you do have to get, at the very least, all the G20 on board, and particularly all the really big countries. And for, th for some of them, these choices are really very, very painful. Um, so I won't talk about China. I'll talk about India, which is a country I know. They have, they've got a lot of discussion of this now. They would like to do this. There is a tiny elite group who are really keen on doing this. But the country is going to grow at 6 or 7% a year. And it's going to have to fit in that envelope, because if they don't do that, the politics will explode. So those are the two necessary conditions, and they're difficult enough. In fact, they're basically impossible. But the, I see the question you've asked as, what do we need to do as a minimum to sell the proposition to our publics domestically and globally? And at the moment, it will be fair to say, really, I think, no significant power has managed to do that. That's depressing. Uh, realistic and is I the agree. Word. I, and I agree. Is. And let, let, let me just add some, you know, just some, some, make the conundrum sharper. As, you know, the Port Talbot steel project just rescued by a combination of uh, Tartar investment and UK government additional subsidies. Uh, which could, if you were an optimist, for, form the backbone of you know, the last bits of the UK steel industry and help revive EVs and an important part of the industrial, the, you know, the last vestiges of the industrial project in this country. The, there has been a fight about whether it will, as they green the steel, whether it will lose 2,000 jobs or not lose any jobs, but not create jobs. Of course so. um, The latest report out of Scotland on on UK's wind production, a rather rosy report from the Scottish government saying by 2050 we anticipate that this is going to create 3,800 great jobs for Scotland, right? Last time I broke that down, that's kind of 300 jobs a month, <laughs> which if you think about what you need to do in order to create social equity, let alone offset the labor corrosive impact of AI and other, and, and other stuff, it's, it doesn't really give us, and if you look at the IRA, all the data on the IRA, perhaps the most remarkable piece of legislation that will give us a, a small chance of getting to net zero, but the labor-creating parts of the IRA are lagging behind the other forms of investment, and that's because the green transition is IP and capital and electron-intensive and not labor-intensive. Well, uh, this is all a colossal in intellectual mistake, so I do cover, do cover this in my book. Um, uh, the, but it takes uh, the energy production systems, which is what we're talking about, have 
always been, well, since the Industrial Revolution began, so it's now 230 years, well, let's say 250 years ago or so, capital intensive, but capital intensive systems, and the new ones won't be any different. Um, we moved out of very, very, you know, labor intensive systems. The most labor intensive part of the energy production system we've ever had was mining coal. Sure. And it seems to me one of our great achievements is we got rid of it because it was an awful job. But the, uh, the new versions, which will consist obviously of solar farms in colossal quantities, wind, possibly in the far or further future fusion, uh, maybe some other really subtle forms of energy capture, going through a highly automated and spectacularly efficient computer-controlled grid system backed up by batteries and so forth, this isn't going to employ anybody in the production of the energy. It, I'm slightly exaggerating. It will employ some people in making this stuff, but not many. And the, this is the first point. The, the second point is even more important and fundamental. Um, because it, you know, this is a subset of a much bigger point, which is why this sort of romanticism about manufacturing jobs is a complete dead end. Um, I think just about the safest prediction one can make about uh, the future of our economies, assuming the end of the world doesn't happen, is that within 30, 40 years, nobody effectively in the world, and certainly nobody in the developed countries, will be employed making anything. Um, so to give you a very crude statistic, um, in 1960, the roughly, between, it depends on the measure, 40 to 50% of the British labor force worked in industry. It's now t 10, depends on how you divide, it's now 10. And the industrial sector has grown a lot. I mean, it hasn't grown, of course, in the way it did in China or, or so forth, but it's grown a lot. And the reason is this is incomparably the easiest sector in which to substitute human beings by machines. And, in and that's not going to change. In fact, everything we do just talked about is going to make that worse. So thinking that this, this is, a, it's the romanticism that somebody, the Biden administration, that they are going to recreate industrial America. They're not. Even in China, the industrial sector as a source of employment is shrinking rapidly. So this is a dead end. What you need to think about is what we can do which, with hopefully free, cheap, clean energy. And lots of what we will do with free, cheap, clean energy is just live, live better lives, and most of the things that turn us, help us live better lives are actually services. So the, the, the service sector will explode in many, many ways, some of them wonderful and some of them are less so, but the, this idea that we will, the green revolution will, as it were, directly solve our employment, it's just weird, it's just completely ahistorical. Well, I, I, I com uh, I mean, lest we lest there be any misunderstanding, I completely agree with you. I bang on about this all the time, and I think the trick is that we have sold ourselves a lie. Well, not we, but there has been a lie told that in fact just green jobs are going to be created by this in transition. order in order to make the industrial working class, which is quite understandably very angry right. and feels they're being victimised, yes. content with this new gimmick which won't actually solve their problems at all. Okay, but, but then I do want to come back to exactly this problem because this is a very important and relevant conversation for a conduit audience, which is to say, if it's not going to be the, the, mass, the, the creation of millions of manufacturing jobs, and if at best what it's going to do is substitute it with a whole bunch of new whiz-bang service jobs, which in fact could be great jobs and you know, better than manufacturing jobs in, in some ways, there will be a period of dislocation and disruption because they'll be with different people in different areas and different geographies requiring different skills. And what's pernicious about that is that at this moment, that group of people who will be dislocated and disrupted as our labor markets shift are people who will be electoral fodder for right-wing anti-green parties 
of which you've seen Rishi Sunak articulate a view and Trump will articulate a view saying, the Green Revolution is going to stop you flying, make you stop eating meat, take away your car, Ulez is going to disrupt you, the man with the van. And in some ways, as disingenuous and as odious those arguments are, they have a purchase. And it's what will happen to those people who are interested in just transition is they will be pounding sand in the way that people didn't like Brexit will be pounding sand. So how could you all of you people be so misguided to vote for something where you were sold a pup and you could be sold a pup a second time? Well, I think that the arguments that, I mean, this is a, a profound difficulty. The, at best, we would substitute a dirty, costly, um, energy system with a clean and with luck somewhat less costly one. That's still an open question. And in the process, we will, um, if we were incredibly successful, I think the time is running out, do a lot about solving the climate problem. But they will still be electrons, and there are, I'm assuming that they are for this process the same marginal cost, let's assume, or the, and the same average cost, that, that's not probably, on the basis of what we know now, colossally wrong, though it's probably a bit pessimistic, then there's no reason why the rest of what's going in in our economy will stop going on. And the most important thing that has been going, have been going on in our economy, uh, over the li our economies everywhere, is... Industry is, uh, continues to be very important, but is steadily becoming completely automated. Basically, as one of my friends pointed out 25 years ago in a particularly brilliant essay, it's just following the path of agriculture. So, you know, the, you could argue the greatest single economic transformation and social transformation in Britain, for example, is that in 1800, roughly, this is, we don't know the city, 60 to 70 percent of the labor force worked on farms and backbreaking labor it was, and now it's about half a percent. Now, manufacturing is following the same path, and this is all going to go, and the factories of the future will just be run by robots. Um, we, we, we made up for that, but that transformation created lots and lots of new jobs, and they were quite good jobs <coughs> for a pretty significant proportion of the population, almost all of whom are highly educated, and we have immeasurably expanded the proportion of our population who go to university, That's a new, and some of them, not enough actually, get pretty good jobs, but the people who lost their jobs in industry have, by and large, they're not wrong. The opportunities they've got on the whole were worse in many respects, less secure, less well-paid, um, uh, more precarious, uh, I've said that, and on the whole, worse paid. We've hollowed out the middle. Um, and this will be part of that. It won't reverse that. Um, so the, uh, and the class divisions that go with that between uh, the su generally successful, well-educated people who think that We've got a gr we've got a reasonable future, and we and climate change is just going to be part of the solution. Uh, what we're going to do on this, and the the gulf between that and people who think actually the economy isn't generating anything useful for me and my children, um, and uh, that gulf is going to grow, and that's the biggest. That's why our polit well, my thesis in my book. That's a very large part of why our it's not the only reason why our politics are blown up. Correct. And, and, and we'll, we'll pause here because we have other matters to discuss. But I think the seminal challenge of our time is for a political party to emerge which is able to sigh into that hurricane of the, this great economic force which is pushing us towards structural inequality in the, in the nature of the way things operate and provide a solve for that in a way that doesn't provide fodder for people who don't want the green transition to, to occur. And it's not in promising that there are going to be loads of green manufacturing jobs. So it's got to be something else. What that is, we'll, we'll return to. But I think it's, that's 
a central conundrum of our time. And that's why the Biden program is, I think, not working as well. One of the reasons is not working politically as well as they work. My friend Paul Krugman, for example, yeah. Yeah. has argued quite correctly that it has created a colossal investment boom. Yeah. And that has helped the, the overall economy a bit. Yeah. But investment booms don't generally, actually in of themselves, generate vast numbers of new sorts of jobs. We know the sort of people who benefit from investment booms, yeah. construction workers, yeah. for example, and that's a pretty small proportion of the labor force. And they may not be in swing states. Um, Okay, I want to talk about China and the and uh, for a moment because I know you are a, you you you've thought a great deal about this and so let's let's stipulate that you know China and the U.S. are going to have to uh, they've been they've been doing a dance and that dance has been for a long time you know a, a trade or a marriage of convenience and now it's you know. Uh, a, a more adversarial stance, and then we've just seen Biden and Xi do a sort of temporary love-in, perhaps. Um, but I'm interested to, to, for you to give us a, just a little bit of a sense of China and to, to talk a little bit about its, its, demogra its, dem its demographics and its governance and the interrelationship between those two in terms of its long-term prospects, and I think that will then slide us into its relationship with the U.S., but just those two. Yes, before I get there, just to, you may want to come back there. I think a key point about the U.S. attitude, and I've met, used this, I think it's a good phrase to describe the U.S. attitude to almost everything that's going on in the world, is they have really severe buyer's remorse. And one of the things they have really severe buyer's remorse about is their willingness, as they see it, not un unreasonably, um, not merely to accommodate China's rise, but to help it. And uh, lots of people now think, that was a terrible mistake. Can we possibly reverse this? Now, and in any case, even, the one, even if they don't think it, and they do, the Chinese have worked out that's what they think. So this is the key part of where, where we are now. This is now getting um, profoundly personal, as it were. Now, the, on the China, I would stress, um, I'm not an expert on China in any real sense, uh, though I've followed the economy closely for 30 years, and I've been there every year uh, at least once or twice since 93, and I've followed it as closely as I can at a distance. Distance has some advantages, but obviously many disadvantages. Um, the, the question um, that you're raising is where, ch in a sense, where does China go next? Seems to me um, one um, to which there is, a, a, there is simply no clear answer because it depends on choices the Chinese alone will make and it's not yet clear what they are going to be. My broad story about where they are, and I sort of summarize something I said in a, another conference uh, uh, recently, is uh, something like this. Um, Deng Xiaoping, who is a re truly remarkable historical figure, decided uh, that the Maoist system was a catastrophe and China was in a colossal crisis. And he was going to forget all the, 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 the sort of ideological side of the system. And he would simply go what he thought would work to get them out of this crisis situation. And he had a model. And the model was the, he, he, what, had hap what had happened in small neighboring countries with similar populations. And he meant by that, Singapore, Hong Kong, South Korea, and before that, Japan. And, the, and he didn't intend to change the political system, its core, but within that, he was prepared to tr do ex colossal amounts of trial and error, including embracing quite, ultimately, quite radical um, market-oriented reform, and it worked, more probably even better than he expected, to do this, he needed w one, at least one, really superb reformer. And he only had one. I think we tend to forget this. And that was Zhu Rongji, who was the prime minister in the 
90s. And pretty well everything that the Chinese economy did, which was so spectacular, had its um, birth, either in the 80s reformers, which has just got them going, but above all in reforms made in the 90s. And they lived off that. It is a, a quote, absolutely crucial point. Um, the second point is China suffers to a very, very severe degree, uniquely severe, from a generalized problem with that model of development, which I won't go into in detail from the macroeconomic point of view, is that it ha rests on stupendously high forced savings. In the Chinese case, they were around about 50% of GDP, and stupendously high investment. And uh, they always had too much savings, but before 2008, they could solve that problem with an immense current account surplus. They were a capital exporter, a colossal cap, which is really weird for one of the poorest countries in the world. Um, after that, to sustain demand, they simply started off, and this is crucial, the biggest property boom in the history of the world. And that's come to an end. And that's their big macro problem. And the third problem and that's what to, I, how I understand Xi, and I think he's been very clear about, that super growth capitalist communist system corrupted the whole of society and the communist party, and she realized that because it was obvious, and decided to stop that, and to stop that, he had to stop all sorts of things that were going on throughout the whole country, which tended to involve corrupt activities from his point of view. So that's where they are now. They have a very unbalanced economy in which the real estate boom can't continue. So what are they going to do now in investment? And the answer to that, I think pretty clearly, is the biggest green investment ever. So that's, that's the optimistic side of it. The only way they can fix their demand problem, I think, given the structure of their demand, is the most gigantically accelerated green investment project. And I think, I've talked to a few people in China, they are thinking in those terms. Where we're talking about really large numbers, uh, whether that's enough to absorb it, I don't know. Um, the, the second uh, problem they're gonna have is they're going to continue with a development model which is more status and will grow significantly more slowly. And optimists in China think they'll grow 4%, four and a half, it could well be significantly lower than that. And that uh, then, with a more centralized dictatorship, and that fits pretty well with your last comment, which is, well, the labor force is shrinking anyway, so that make, makes this happen pretty naturally. Uh, I think these problems they have are soluble, but what manageable, I think the idea that they will sort of simply collapse and fall over it doesn't seem to be very plausible, but it is reasonable to assume from where we are now that Chinese growth is in, in the, if things go well, four to five, and more plausibly even below that, and these various forces, and I haven't even added in the deglobalization story, or at least the difficulty of this, and the pressure from America, tends to mean that though China will grow faster than the developed world, it will get relatively bigger. Its days of hypergrowth are over. And does that mean to you again to kind of, China's not going to become a democracy anytime soon, but this sort of precarious shift that has to happen, we've, one of the things we've, we've seen in the last 10 years at least is the return of great power conflict. That conflict has caused an end of the peace dividend when you see Germany putting 100 billion euros into its military and Sweden's defense spending going up by 30%, you know that something wacky is happening in the world. Right. Um, and, and, and that decline of a peace dividend is unfortunate but perhaps necessary uh, if you want Europe to have its own defense capability. But uh, what we don't want, if we didn't like Russia, Ukraine, and we don't like what's happening in the Middle mm. East, we don't want China, Taiwan to upset the apple cart. Do you think that it's less likely that China will be adventurous on ta Taiwan because it's more precarious and will then come to a detente with the US and maybe there's a kind of soft landing in that relationship? Or do you think it will tip Xi over to look for a dog, you know, tail wags the dog distraction? 
One of the things I, you, I think it was your, the opening that was given, actually, not by you, but David. The, um, one of the things, well, I'm pretty hopeless at forecasting these events, so the honest answer is I don't know. But I, I think of it as something, the way to think about them is, I suspect nobody really does know, except that it's obviously, n the probability of this happened is somewhere between zero and one, and we're really debating where it is in that. Uh, um, uh, but the, the, there's a bigger point here, which is, if you look at the world, and I give a lot of presentations when I talk about this, it's quite easy to make a long list of high impact events, which are all perfectly feasible. None of the shocks that have happened to us in the last 25 years, you know, global financial crisis, or 20 years, global financial crisis, or pandemics, or a war between Russia and Ukraine, or a war in the Middle East. I mean, none of these are in the least bit inconceivable, and there are lots more I can conceive, which are, you know, I won't go into them all. The point about them is, we know their their non their probabilities are zero in any given period, but it's not very high, and it's very plausible that some of them will happen over any given period. So one of the presentation when I do this, I tend to say, well, in every one of the last decades, something very big happened that nobody expected. That's been true for since 1970. I can go through them all if you want. And so something big will happen that isn't expected. And I have no idea whether it's going to be the invasion of Taiwan. A few years ago, we were all obsessed with the idea, you know, 10 years ago actually, that the Chinese and the Japanese were going to fight over the Senkaku Islands. That went away because it seemed so ridiculous. And that we constantly, when we talk about this, then go back to the First World War and make, well, it was Sarajevo, wasn't it? And that started the end of the world, as it were. So the honest answer is we're bound to have these things around. It's impossible to know how likely they are. But, okay, I will go out on a limb, and I will say that she is much more rational than Putin. He knows that adding Taiwan to his empire will just create nothing but problems. Uh, uh, huge ones, um, and uh, and uh, China is going to, with all probability, continue to rise for the reason not so far, but continue to rise. So, starting a war will be completely mad, and therefore we won't do it. And of course, the counter to that is when is the fact that something is mad stop uh, uh, a tyrant from deciding to do it anyway? And that's a perfectly good argument. So in what we're basically doing, I don't think it's terrible, trying to forecast the decision-making process of one individual, and I suspect he doesn't know himself, and his wife doesn't know, and certainly I don't. So the answer to you is, I think not. We must assume not, because it will be completely mad, but I suppose if we back him into a, a corner sufficiently, and he really thinks there's nothing else for him but that, well, maybe he will do it. I have two final questions before we turn to your audience. The, you are, um, I suspect, geeky enough to know about the term Minsky moment. Of course. Uh, I wrote a whole book about it. Uh, well, th well, there you go. <laughs> well, there, well, then that's great. Um, then I'm then then I'm then I'm going to a let you sort of do the the the, the little the short summary of a Minsky moment, but I wonder where the climate is doesn't potentially present us with a Minsky moment and it, whether it occurs through the vehicle of insurance. And let me put it to you okay. and then have you let you knock it down as you might or or not. Um, it seems to me that that that. With forest fires, floods, storms, and other mass destructive climate events, there are whole swathes of both property and industry that are becoming difficult to insure, if not uninsurable. And you begin to see that when the insurers sit down with the reinsurers and have their annual haggle, the reinsurers are beginning to say to the insurers, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to take that, thank you very much. And if you start having whole asset classes that you can't get insured, you can't get them financed as well. And you, in the just in the purest thing, if those of you are mortgage, if your bank requires you to be insured and you can't get insurance because you're too close to forests, and those forests, if you're in California, are about to you know, go on fire, 
you have huge swathes, trillions of dollars of assets that will go from, to, to use your word, one to zero. And that can be a massive collapse in asset values. And it seems to me that we may, we may be sleepwalking into a Minsky moment for climate and that people aren't talking about it enough. enough. Okay. Um, I don't think it's a Minsky moment. But let me explain what I mean. I'm, this is not something I've thought about much, so I'm making it up as I go along, which is, of course, what journalists do. Uh, the, the, uh, but I like to have a few bits of evidence before I start. So the essence of the Minsky moment idea, which, by the way, wasn't Minsky's phrase. It was used by his disciples. Uh, but basically, his idea is um, in finance. It is captured in the, this wonderful very simple sentence, stability destabilizes. So imagine you live in a nice, stable world, assets are nicely behaved, you've got stable returns and all the rest of it, and something happens to make you feel more optimistic. It might be a big fall in interest rates. It might be the arrival of a new and exciting economy in the world. Or it might be both, such as the entry of China and a, an immensely rapid reduction in real interest rates from the late 1980s onwards. OK, that suddenly makes assets look more attractive, so people start speculating on them. And the conditions for this are very favorable. And the speculation turns out to be sensationally profitable. And as a result of this, more and more people, this is sort of the rational stage of the speculative bubble, but more and more people get into it. And increasing the people who get into it uh, are getting into it not because they've worked out there's a fundamental change in conditions which justifies taking these risks, they're getting into it because they've noticed that these asset prices go up, and therefore they think, if I get these assets, they will go up for me now, and that way I can borrow on the hope that my, these asset prices will just go up. Then you're in clear bubble territory, and sooner or later the bubble reaches its limit, even in these favorable conditions, and people realize these asset prices aren't going up anymore, and then they default. And when they default, all the financial institutions that finance them go under, and then we have a colossal financial crisis. And it's this moment of realization, there's nothing underneath this, I have to get out, that is the Minsky moment. Okay, is that a good parallel for where we are on sure. climate? I think there is, there is another thing that could happen in the world. So one possibility is people think they've got all these safe assets and they suddenly realize they're completely unsafe and therefore the financial system is dead. Uh, I can see that logic. It depends ultimately whether the assets that are going to be most effective are particularly highly leveraged. And the financial institute, the main central banks will tell you that most of the sorts of assets that are going to be most affected are not particularly highly leveraged. And I haven't looked, at, I've written about this in the past, but I haven't looked at this more carefully. There is another possibility, which it doesn't require a Minsky moment, which is basically it just kills investment. So, because, because pretty obviously, if you want to make an investment to which terrible things can happen, and you can't insure it, you won't want to make the investment at all. Because what you're trying to do is get somebody else to take a risk, and nobody else wants to take this risk because it's so obviously a, a bad risk. And once we move into a world in which you can recognize the nature of all those risks, it's not a Minsky, it's not unknown, we're not in a Ponzi game. We're just beginning to realize that you know, building stuff in floodplains or near forests or in places, building farms in places that are going to become deserts or anything like that is just a completely dud activity and it's going to stop. And so what will happen might not be a financial crisis, so it's clearly there might be some financial, but basically just whole slates, ways of activity will stop because they're just hopelessly unprofitable given the recognized risks 
to which they run. And both of these are possible scenarios, but I tend to think, this is really a priori, I'm not at all sure, that the latter is the more plausible story than the former. Just lots of stuff won't happen. And then you get the really interesting question, well, what do governments do then? They will be under pressure, and this is where the Ponzi game might, they may, might be under pressure to take the risks on their balance sheets, as we did with the financial center, and they will take these insurance risks and subsidize these risks. And this will add to all the other fiscal pressures we see upon them, and what, the, the Minsky moment will be in public finance. Final question. Um, I want to ask you a question about carbon and about carbon pricing, uh, and, and not just carbon pricing, but what's happening to the strange thing we call carbon in two ways. One is California's just passed a law which will soon come into action, which will cause banks to have to disclose their scope three carbon emissions. In other words, not just uh, the carbon emissions <coughs> of uh, your branches and your your flights of your bankers, but the carbon emissions of the companies that you lend money to or you underwrite or you have any degree of proximate investment in. And that's going to be interesting for people who have up to now tried to stand a little bit between themselves and carbon. And then the European Union is going to create cross-border carbon pricing in terms of its taxation, which is going to put a price on carbon even in countries, if, if a trade war doesn't arise and if the Europeans hold up, even in countries which don't have carbon prices because they're going to be taxed if they want to export to the EU. And so carbon is going to become, I think, economically and politically salient in ways that it hasn't been before. And as a person who likes markets and likes disclosure, I'd like you to sort of just freewheel for a little bit about what you think is going to happen as a result of those two things. Well, um, I've always wondered how far we can get pricing through the back door, as it were. I mean, coming back to your earlier discussion of the politics of pricing, uh, uh, I mean, to me, a, a beautiful counterindicator is that every year, since I think 2010, or somebody will give me the right number, the British government chancellor has ostentatiously said that the indexing of fuel prices that was supposed to happen wouldn't, fuel taxes. Um, and, and, and the result is that what Gordon Brown thought when he introduced this would steadily escalate the price of uh, uh, our petrol um, hasn't happened. And now, other things have changed this, um, but, and that was the closest we ever got to a carbon price uh, and so that just shows how damn difficult it is to do. It comes back to the early, uh, earlier discussion. And you know, like most economists, 20 years ago, I thought carbon pricing was the solution. And all I can say, if it's the solution, it has a hell of a long time coming. Uh, the, but my reaction to your specific examples, and this is going to depress you, I suppose. Well, I mean, the government of California can do whatever, whatever it pleases. All activity involving significant lending uh, to industries that might or may not be uh, uh, emitting, we'll come to that in a second, will simply move out of California and move to, uh, to banks uh, that who's, which are located in other jurisdictions in the United States. California might say, well, if you do any business in California, you will be forced to do this. Well, some of them will might well say, yeah, California is very, very important, but it's not that important. Okay, if necessary, we'll break our bank into two completely different parts. There'll be a California JP Morgan, completely separate bank, and there'll be the other bits of JP Morgan, and they have nothing legally to do with e each other. Um, I would suspect his attempt to impose this all on its own, different with the motor vehicles that people drive, uh, won't work. It's a the second problem, of course, is this is a hell of an accounting problem. I mean, to put it mildly, if you lend uh, to any major company, let's suppose you lend to Apple. Apple doesn't need much. You lend to any of these companies. For Apple to work out credibly what its total emissions are, 
involves, in addition, knowing the emissions of every supplier it has in every country in the world. And every supplier's suppliers, suppliers' emissions too. And my guess is, I know there's lots of discussions, it just can't be done. But if it can be done, it will be gained to an absolutely insane degree. So I think this is going to be really, really difficult. If you have carbon pricing, there'll be a government machinery which imposes a duty on every company and ultimately has to be in the world to do this reporting. I don't think California or the banks will be able to do this on their own at all. And this comes back to the, to the EU's um, uh, um, carbon border adjustment mechanism. Um, it will cause a trade war, and I don't know how it will go. Um, it might be more effective. It's, EU is a big market. It might be more effective in spreading carbon uh, pricing around the world. But it should be noted the EU's own carbon pricing is only marginally effective. So if everybody follows what the EU is doing, I don't think it's going to transform the world. Um, so I think these are very interesting ideas. Um, but we should not be over optimistic that these are going to fix the problem, particularly given we have so few years left. Th that's probably a good note to kind of turn off to. Let's interesting ideas. Let's not be over optimistic. That sort of summarizes the conversation. Um, I'm going to In hand. In the end, there is no substitute for serious political will. I completely agree with you. I completely agree. Um, here we go. Let's let's hand over to the audience. Jan, please. Um, Martin, thank you, as always, brilliant. Um, could I turn back to the title uh, of this evening in, uh, on democracy and <laughs> your view on the reason why democracy is foundering a bit? Because there is a sense that maybe it's a real crisis of leadership democracies are not delivering on the expectations of the citizens so people move to the extremes. That's a hypothesis. And you get the feel that the leadership elite is really acting with impunity in their own self-interest as opposed to integrity in the public interest. And that's creating this crisis of democracy. And I was just wondering your views on, on that. Thank you. Well, I think that's not a bad uh, summary uh, the, of a very, very long book. Um, the, uh, there's an element which isn't in the book as well as it should be, um, but it fits very well with what you said. Um, so. I, I'll, let me leave aside the whole rest of the world, which is a sort of completely different story, and just focus on core Western countries, which is a focus of my book. So we've got Europe, um, North America. Um, I don't have a discussion of Japan, sui generis. I mean, there's a limit to what I focus on. And I think there are things going on in uh, former Soviet bloc countries and countries like Turkey and India, which are somewhat different. So let's focus on us. So I would say that one way of thinking about our history is that by the middle of the 20th century, early to middle 20s, it was obvious to pretty well any, everybody who, who was thinking straight at all that these societies were in near terminal crisis. And uh, this was sort of fairly obviously demonstrated by ending up with two world wars, a colossal depression, unresolved class warfare, um, uh, and the complete collapse of democracy in most many countries in continental Europe. And uh, pretty dicey moments somewhere elsewhere. So after the war, we, we emerge with a somewhat different leadership. And I think it would be fair to say, of all of them, 
they're all different, that their view was never again. Okay? That, and many of them, of course, were leaders, people who'd served in the wars. And, and if not, they'd served in the administrations of people like FDR. And they wanted to change things. And they did. Okay? Uh, in many, many ways, they did. And uh, by and large, very successfully, these were uh, very egalitarian societies by previous and subsequent description. They grew very rapidly. There was a lot of luck involved in that. Um, uh, within the Western world, there was a clear hegemon and peace, all this, okay? And a fair way of thinking about the last 40, 50 years say, since the 70s, when things started to go wrong and there was a resurrection of a different kind, that um, we had the victory in the Cold War um, and people just took all that for granted. They took the peace, stability, democratic uh, foundations, they just took it for granted. I did too. I'm clear, 25 years ago, I took it for granted. And the... And we then, and this is the core of the book, two things happen together. Developments in the economic system, a lot of which you couldn't have changed, like deindustrialization, which is a very big thing, and many other changes in our economy, driven by the economy, of which actually globalization, though significant, was not the most important by any means, plus a fundamental transformation in our political economy from the idea that politics was important to thinking that politics is what gets in the way, to thinking that the good life and the, the life in which you contribute to society most is by, by being a successful entrepreneur. And, and, uh, and this just changed, I think, in a very profound way, social values and how the society worked. And in some ways, it was ineluctable. It was bound to happen. Long periods of peace... Uh, change the way society operate, and you start getting pretty crazy politics. And this brings me back to the, the thing that is probably s the single thing I got most out of Barbara Tuchman's Guns of August, which is, and I'm not pushing it this far, but her basic view is, by 1914, an awful lot of people thought they would like to have a war because it would be real and exciting and, and, and meaningful in a way that their lives weren't. We got how much desire there was. And there seemed to me quite clearly a lot of people around now who just want a punch-up. Okay? That's part of what they... And they want their leaders to do that, too. So we have moved, and so the most pessimistic view I have is close to your, ever implied by yours, is we, it goes wrong because that's what happens to human society if they enjoy very long periods of peace and prosperity. And they are. Then, of course, and this is where it really gets close, this is not part of my book, then it seems to me the peace and prosperity starts really to curdle. It doesn't work anymore. The very large parts of the society begin to feel, well, it's working for them, but it's not working for me. And it's a large chunk of the society, including all the people affected by deindustrialization. The, the, in Britain, the regional problem is essentially a deindustrialization problem in large part, and the same is true in America and so forth. Huge shifts in class power, the collapse of trades unions and so forth, and a very significant part of our population feels uh, they've been abandoned, and they're despised too. And uh, meanwhile, the class of people who probably most naturally has come to despise them, which are uh, educated people who've been to universities, particularly younger ones, um, feel pretty unhappy too, because they thought they were going to get great, wonderful jobs, and they aren't there, and they've can't even buy a house. So you've got an enormous reservoir of anger in our societies, and that makes it very, very difficult to pursue what more to think of as what I would have thought of as moderately sensible, reasonable policy, and it's a wonderful, wonderful territory for populists, for demagogues. Uh, and we've seen that here, with the, in my view, with the Brexit campaign. It's obvious with Trump. We see it in a wise, 
why is Maloney the Prime Minister of Italy? Why is Marine Le Pen likely to be the next president of France? Uh, I mean, not everybody thinks so, but all well, my French friends think so. Uh, that, that tells you a lot about them. Um, why do, is the FD, AFD now 20% of the vote in Germany, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, so that's where we are. And the truth is, I and lots of other people, I think, didn't realize that how fragile our, the underpinnings of our system were. And I think it's for these, the interaction of those two reasons. We, we've become used to stability, so we think we can experiment in ways that our parents would have said, my parents certainly would say, are crazy. And we have created a very large number of people who are highly dissatisfied, and conventional politics has absolutely no good answer. Now, unconventional politics, as we can see very clearly, also has absolutely no good answer. Uh, and that was also the lesson of the 20s and 30s, but they haven't been tried yet. I'm going to, Rosie has given me the, the hook. Someone asked the lady over there. Yes, please. I've been very bad. Um, future answers will all be 30 seconds. <laughs> um, hi, Martin. Um, I was just thinking about rethinking democracy as well. Um, I'm an advocate for citizens' assemblies, and I'd be interested in your thoughts about how participatory democracy might be able to restore health and security to our what we're feeling are de delicate democracies now. Well, it, it's a proposal I support. It's in my book. I've written columns about it. And last week, I did a debate at Nesta with my friend Nicholas Gruen on it. And uh, so in, to, to vow that it's within my th uh, uh, 30 seconds, I'm, I think this is something we should seriously experiment with. How exactly to integrate it into... Uh, a representational democracy, because I don't think we can get rid of this. Uh, I don't think we can go, well, I will be very nervous, probably tells them, if we went all the way back to Athens, even if we could do it electronically, I would really find that pretty damn scary. Uh, the, but the, the only other point I would add, and it is a very large part of my book, but it's not, I think, the most satisfactory, is Changing the mechanism of democracy is, I think, genuinely important. And it could have helped, I think, for instance, with our discussion over Brexit, things like that. But we also are going to have to change our substantive, substantive policy systems, above all in our economy. And that is a deeper set of, uh, a deeper sort of, issues. So we haven't discussed capitalism here, but one of the questions that I discuss, I'm not sure I have completely clear answers, is whether shareholder, shareholder dominated capitalism is actually a functional model for us anymore. I think we should be asking questions like that. That's a kind of taster to leave us with. Uh, Rose, do we have one more? Can we do one more? Yeah, we've got one more here. Okay, go. I, I mean, building on from that, actually, my name's John Alexander. Um, my question to you is really about what that role might start to be and what those voices and what the, where that power in the economy might be. And I'm interested, we've talked, like, the view of view through the lens of, the ec of economics for the last 80 years or so has been of people as labour and as consumers. We talked just briefly about people as citizens and kind of participants in democracy. I'm also interested in your view on, like, ownership, and, and, so, and particularly thinking about energy systems before, the role of community energy, for example, is it possible that there could be a kind of community-intensive version of an economy uh, and, and, and ownership as a, as a different role rather than just labor and consumers? The honest answer I'm, is I don't know. <laughs> the, the um, I mean, obviously, historically, there have been local public utilities we could perfectly well imagine local public utilities, water systems and so forth. We can have a discussion of how bigger the system needs to be. Um, but I don't think that's transformative. These have existed uh, before. The, the deeper question is, um, is it possible let me step back. 
it seems to me pretty clear, I'm with my friend Paul Collier, the corporation as an entity is a very remarkable invention which has generated staggering, unbelievable increases in productivity and therefore welfare in the long run um, because, as Brad DeLong particularly argues, it's, it has to a very substantial degree internalized innovation as part of the productive system. And that was a completely new invention, innovation in human society. So I want to maintain these things. The question is, how do you maintain these things, corporations, uh, while directing them towards a m broader view of their duties and obligations than those of maximizing shareholder returns? <coughs> there was a big effort in Yugoslavia, which I studied quite carefully um, for 50 years ago, on workers' control. And I think there are very big reasons why that doesn't fully work. My friend Colin Meyer talks a lot about purpose, and I'm not completely sold on that either. So, and then of course you get into things like technical policy tax and all the rest of it, and dis redistribution, that's pretty standard. But I do think that I would like to feel there is a way in which we could maintain what the corporation does without making it so narrow in its internalized purposes. And I have, in my book, it will be fair to say I've described this very clearly as a problem, but it isn't clear to me that there is a solution. And your proposal, I'm sorry it goes on, I didn't mean, is the problem with community ownership is defining in a relevant way what the community is. For a major corporation, what is the community? to which it responds. Um, they're just all over the place. So they are actually responsible to multiplicity of communities. And trading off those different communities against one another is very, very, very hard. And we don't have a solution. The one answer you might give is, well, we stop any company being multinational. But if you stop that, you're stopping what is probably the most powerful single system for transferring intellectual property across the world. So it's just damned hard, and I don't have a very simple answer. I apologize. M Martin, you're not supposed to end a conversation with an amuse-bouche. You're supposed to start a conversation with an amuse-bouche, but I think you've left us hungry for more. Uh, very, very, very interesting conversation. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, continue the conversation. Go grab a drink in the bar. Go up to the third floor. Um, and thank you so much for being with us.